Hey everybody, I'm about to be joined by Laura Rose, who is founder of LGBT Mummies Tribe. And we're gonna be talking about her personal experience of um, having her family with her wife um, and the outrageous treatment that she received um, at hospital when their first was born. So um, I'm just going to join her now. There we go got any questions as we're talking then please fire them across we're really talking about personal experiences and the amazing community that she's set up as a consequence hi. hi how are you i'm good thanks how are you not bad thanks it's been quite a hot day here hasn't it so hot like <laughs> my back is burning <laughs> it's not good i know look i know such a sticky night um thanks for coming on tonight um, no i'm just problem. introducing you um do you want to start by talking about your um personal experience and i'm sure people may have seen today that um you've just written a brilliant article or mm -hmm. um you know you're, you've written about your personal experience which went yeah. live on fertility help hub today yeah so you, can, you can read that but we'll talk a bit about, about that so i mean i guess when i was reading your story i was absolutely shocked at the treatment that you got and the kind of disrespect and disgust from people at the hospital so can you tell people joining a little bit more about what happened and how you felt um so we'd had a really really good experience at first of all in hospital in Essex um the midwives that we had there was two of them that were absolutely amazing really inclusive um just exactly what you'd want from that kind of service they ask questions hope you don't mind can we ask and um, we're not sure what to use language wise they were just absolutely wonderful and they made the experience really special um so we were kind of in this like magical bubble um of happiness when our child arrived um and then the next day Stacey had a c-section so the next day she was getting checked and they asked me to bring the baby in for the usual checks um weight movements legs etc um so i walked in with dotty and um there was a doctor and she had her back to me so she turned around she looked me up and down and I said, oh, I'm here um, for Dottie's checks. Yeah. And she um, she, and she said Stacey's name. And I said, oh, no, I'm Laura Rose. And she just looked at me really confused. And she said, no, I want her mother. And I said, oh, I am her mother. And then it was kind of really awkward. And I went, oh, I'm her other mother. I'm not her birth. And I was trying to explain. Oh. She just, it was like, a, looked me up and down. It was like a disdainful, disgusted look. Like, oh, I get what you mean now. And she was like, no, no. And she went like that with her hand. She went, I don't want you. I want her, I want her real mother. I want her, get me, get me her real mother to the, to the nurse. And okay. obviously you're talking about like six and a half years ago, even back then, yeah. there wasn't that many same sex families about having children. Um, I think that the midwives we spoke to said that we were the, only the second family that they'd had at that hosp hospital. Mm -hmm. So for them, they were just like, when we told them afterwards they were like mortified but for us we had never been prepared emotionally for anyone saying anything like that um mm -hmm. and I think that's why it's so important for us now as the LGBT mummies tribe to support non-biological mothers as well as birth mothers because it's the psychological side that no one really speaks about it's oh you don't want to sit there and be like oh but what about me you know this is how I feel but then on the other hand you get that kind of embarrassment like Am I valid? Have I got to validate myself to everyone? And then in that moment, like the bubble just burst yeah. and it just, it's ruined, happy time. it just ruined the whole mm -hmm. moment. And I kind of am really direct and upfront and I, you know, speak to anyone. And I kind of was like this blubbery mess. I was like, Ugh! and the nurse looked at me apologetically as if to say, well, this is what she's always like. Um, and I went, but I, I am her mother. I'm her, I'm her mum as well. And I was trying to get out and she just went like that and showed me and went, get me her real mother and the nurse escorted me out and I just broke down like yeah. in tears and Stacey come through and was like what's wrong and I couldn't even get my words out and I just don't think I was emotionally prepared to be dismissed in my role that way mm -hmm. and so from that moment on for a good I'd say a good year or so after yeah. I just felt I had to validate myself in every situation it was embarrassing in the end yeah. I'd have to validate myself in the car park the supermarket or if someone come up and went oh what a lovely baby I'd have to kind of make a point of being in the conversation <laughs> and like being like yeah I'm her mum as well and it was embarrassing yeah. but I didn't even realize I was doing it you know 
I just wanted to cuddle her all the time. I wanted her with me. And at the time, because we didn't know any other families, I didn't know what I was doing was yeah. slightly at times neurotic and I was but at the same time it was valid because yeah. it was how I felt and how that woman that doctor had made us feel and obviously we did put in a complaint to pals and apparently we'd been told that you know she's always getting complaints about her but it was probably a homophobic thing because of the specific country she was from it's illegal which I get it's learnt behavior it's society that she's been brought up in but at the same time it's supposed to be a magical time and she just completely ruined that. And then the time afterwards, it just felt, um, and that for me, I just, it kind of put me in this like really anxious state yeah. of having to validate myself in every situation. And it was just mm. really, really rubbish, really. I'm so sorry. That's horrible. I think yeah. the other thing that really upset me about reading that story over, like on top of how you were feeling, of course, was the fact that, the way that she behaved after she found that out with your child was different. Yeah. And that, like, disgusts me too, the fact that... Uh, yeah. You can explain. You can explain. It's, yeah. Yeah, well, after that, because she still continued while she was waiting for me to get out the room to do the checks, but after she realised who I was and what I was, those checks, obviously, they do with the legs of the baby, and she was doing this thing where she held the baby and she was dropping the baby... But she was being so forceful. And in the end, I was like, can you stop that? And she just ignored me. And I was like, can you stop that? And in the end, I just screamed, give me the baby now. Give me a na give me her back now. And I grabbed her. And then I was just sobbing. And it wasn't even like, oh, no, this I'm doing this because it's a medical thing. Because when we had our son, I was really nervous when um, yeah. Stacey wasn't there, when he had his checks. And this male doctor came in and asked how I was and how did the birth go and how beautiful he was. All the things that you want to hear from a doctor and he I was really nervous I was thinking oh my god is is that normal and now when he was doing it with him I was like no that's that isn't normal she was doing it to prove a point that she didn't like what I was and was throwing the baby around and it was it was a horrible horrible moment and I think it, it'll always tar and tank that part of our journey which is a shame I mean you know <clears throat> were things different with your son completely different and in regards to you, well, for your feelings, was that because you were the birth mother, or do you think that you have moved, you'd moved on since the birth of your daughter? Um, and did your wife kind of feel the emotions that you'd been feeling the first time round? I think with our first, we had never gone through it. And we didn't know any other couples like us, so we had no central support system. And when you have your first, you get it all wrong, and you're like, "Shh, be quiet. The baby needs to yeah. sleep," and you just get everything wrong. Um, when it comes to your second, we were so relaxed. We'd had Dottie, and I was like, "If we get pregnant, we get pregnant. If we don't, we've we've got a miracle." Um, so I was really relaxed the whole way through. I worked right up until my due date. I wasn't nervous, anxious. Um, and Stacey's quite a strong character anyway, and she's not as emotive as I am. Um, and she was absolutely fine the whole process through. And I think it does depend on your um, personality because there are some women out there that would go, well, actually, I'm a non-biological mum and I'm absolutely fine. I never experienced those feelings. But had I not had that experience at the hospital, would I have felt like that for a year or so after? Would I have had to validate myself? I don't know. I think it triggered something that maybe either was laying dormant in my mind or just kind of released more anxiety because I was like, oh, my God, that's how mm. other people are going to view me as not the real mum. But with Stanley, no, we didn't have any of that that kind of doubt or stress or worry because we were treated professionally by the medical people. Um, we'd done it before, so we were a lot more relaxed. Um, the birth was really traumatic and it was a lot worse than Dottie's, but... No, we, it just felt different. But I guess as well, I was carrying. Um, so it was a new experience. I didn't really know how to react with it all, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. And what about <clears throat> picking the sperm donor? How was that? Was that an exciting time? Like, did you, I, I know you've written about this in the article, about what you were looking for in the donor. Mm -hmm. um, but how did you start the process? And what kind of advice would you give to people who might be watching, who are thinking about doing something similar at the moment? Um, it is a really, really strange experience. So it's kind of like shopping for the most expensive pair of shoes that you'll never take off your feet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a yeah. really <laughs> surreal experience. Yeah. So when it came to choosing, we were like, 
again we didn't know anyone or have anyone to ask but we were like oh well what do we find attractive in a woman um what do we find attractive in each other what attributes are do we think of each other are the best attributes mm -hmm. so um stacy was really sporty um i was sporty but also i did musical theater and i was a performer when i was younger um so we were trying to take bits and pieces of each other's personalities um and then we've basically both got the kind of same taste in women and you know we like olive skin dark hair dark eyes so we knew what kind of guy that we would be looking for um mm -hmm. We wanted someone who was family orientated. We wanted someone who was healthy. Um, and with the sperm bank that we went with, they gave a really comprehensive and in-depth understanding of who he was, um, down to immediate family, down to aunts, uncles, how they died, the thickness of their hair, their height, yeah. and um, down to genetic conditions. So obviously when you were looking and you'd find someone, but then they all died incredibly young or they had a lot of cancer in their family, we wanted to be careful that we chose a donor, um, that you know it wouldn't pass on to the children so mm -hmm. it, it, it's a really stretch but funnily enough we picked the same kind of looking donors so we were going through and we were like, oh he's nice he's nice and it is it's like shopping for a virtual boyfriend it's very odd yeah. <laughs> but, and someone's yeah, asked so... how you chose the sperm bank that you chose um, and then so if you answer that and then I can answer that from um, a point of picking a donor with male infertility yeah <laughs> Say that again. Uh, how did you pick the sperm bank? Um, again, it was just, we knew someone that had used Zytec. Um, so we just used them. Back then, you're talking like eight years ago, we didn't know anyone. There wasn't, a, social media wasn't as big a thing. You couldn't just find pe other people's experiences and reviews. But luckily we got really lucky because they were really great. Um, we ordered quite a lot of vials from them in the, in the beginning and then we ordered some more halfway through um, when things weren't working. But they were just really professional. They're in America and their shipping time was really, really quick. So it really worked for us. Um, and the team were really kind and professional. So it, it was, at the time, easy. And did you go for an open donor or an anonymous donor? Um, in the UK, the law states that the children can obviously find out who the donor is yeah. at the age of 18. Yeah. He um, confirmed that, obviously, legally, for him to donate, he was aware of that. If they reached 18 and wanted to reach out, he said he would be happy with that for us. Um, obviously, as a parent, we don't want them to feel the need to because we want them mm -hmm. to feel loved enough that we're their, their family. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to that age... It is their decision. Um, you know, we've kept all the files, we've kept all the images, all the details. And when it comes to that time, um, we will sit them down and explain to them in full and give them their folders. And if they feel the need to reach out to him, and th that's their decision. Um, so, yeah, for us, that, that was the way we went. And um, just thinking about the current the current type, like now, um, now your children are obviously a bit older. Um, mm. How old are they? Sorry, you did say six, six and two and a half. Six and two and a half. So the six-year-old, um, does she? Ha ha what do you tell her now? And does she ask about your family setup? She doesn't really question it at all. Um, and she's quite astute. She's like a little old lady, so she talks like a ninety-year-old uh -huh. woman from the forties. She's really <laughs> funny. Um, but she doesn't because from birth I created them both like photo books and one's called the Princess Dottie story and one's called the Prince Stanley story and they're like bedtime photo books um, and it tells of two queens in a castle and they loved each other very much and they wished on a star um, oh, and wow. God helped the doctor plant a seed in mummy's belly and the zoo into a baby and then the baby arrived and everyone in the kingdom come to see the beautiful baby and that's the story that they've got at the moment when she gets to a later age I'll do an age appropriate book then so it may be a bit more grown up and it may explain it in a bit more layman's terms at the moment that's age appropriate for her now and for him but as they get older we will change yeah. that so that, that we'd always be honest with them it's their journey as well so yeah. but that's how it's what a creative thing to do. You're making me wish I'd done something like that. Um, it was so literally she... on Tesco. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So to answer that person's question, the way that um, my husband and I chose a sperm bank, um, it, we actually looked at quite a few before we settled on ours. And I think that we didn't have a huge pool of men. 
because yeah. we were trying to find someone who matched my husband. Um, yeah. So it was a really painful experience picking a donor for us because oh, okay. uh, we were mourning his loss of genetics and it was like bittersweet looking at photos of him as a child trying to pick someone based on the way he looks and not just yeah. the way he looks but his character too. That must um, be really hard. Which was really hard and actually the first donor we picked um, some of you may have heard me talk about this before. Uh, we had all the vials sent to our hospital in New York. And then we got a call just as I arrived to start the stimulation to say that the donor we'd picked had had um, a child just very recently with someone else uh, with genetic tumours on the body. So we had oh, to go again with him in London and me in New York in 24 hours. So actually our picking process was not enjoyable, but no. we couldn't be more delighted with the outcome. Now, now that Yeah. Know. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, it's mad, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. It really is. Um, and if anyone's got any questions as we're chatting, please ask or any thoughts or let us know what your you know, situation is, what you're doing. Um, and so do you have any advice for anyone who might be starting out with this process? I think just take your time. I think sometimes people get in like a bit of a stressful is they think oh my god you know I'm getting older um, I need to do it now and they rush to try and you know get to the finish line I think yeah. it's something that's so important take your time get a get a notepad um, a planner and just write down you know financial a timeline of when you want to be pregnant by um, yeah you know write down um, the different I think the internet's gone a bit funny Sorry, the internet went a bit funny. Actually, no, you know, what's... Yeah, it cut out then. Um, no, I was just saying all the different routes, you don't yeah. actually know right for you because you might not be aware. So you might say, no. oh, IVF's right for me, but then realise IUI can work for you because you're fertile. There might be tests you need to do first before you make the decision. Um, finance as well, you don't want that extra added stress of thinking this is what we need to do we need to do IVF but oh my god it's a huge cost give yourself time plan it out make sure financially you're stable and that you can afford to do it um, and work together and have an agreement a timeline if it doesn't happen in this time that's okay we'll start again here because financial stress plus the stress of doing it plus work plus if you've already got children all of yeah. that just can really have like detrimental effect on your egg quality mm -hmm. um for example if you're going down that route so mm -hmm. just you know really research speak to people go through our page ask questions contact us and we have a trying to conceive support group for lgbt plus women who you know want to start a family and want to speak to others doing the same thing um so people are welcome to join that as well just take your time and really really research and know this is exactly the path we want to take mm -hmm. um before you start because you don't want to get halfway through and then run out of money or you know you're in a really stressful situation it's yeah. it's not the time to be stressed yeah. <laughs> it's hard enough and i think i think also um think if you might want to have more children potentially in the future as well um we're using the same day now might be worth buying more vials or um you know more sperm to uh, potentially allow for that in the future because you just don't know as you said how long it's going to take exactly and that's what when we speak to people and janine t we will answer your question mm -hmm. um in a minute just while i remember um but in regards to that we bought seven vials and then we bought another seven because stacy had polycystic ovaries so we knew that it would take a few times and then what happens is obviously with uk like donors that can be used in the uk it's only 10 families so once he's done 10 families that's it um yeah. so for us it was making sure that we got enough files um and then it covered obviously me having our second and then it, we've got some still frozen so always make sure that even though the cost is painful mm. make sure that you allocate enough if you are going to carry and your partner that you've got enough for both and yeah. some more um yeah, and Janine T said about fertility test and you get that through the NHS or would you go through a clinic good, really good question because when we had Dottie um you're talking six seven eight years ago Stacey went through the NHS for her test she had to pay 25 pound to get a certificate for the clinic to say that all the STD tests, gonorrhea, et cetera, that she had to have prior to treatment meant that 
um, we could go forward with treatment. So we had a copy, £25 from the NHS, and we gave it to the clinic. I went right. to do that this time. They don't do it anymore. I think they've cottoned on that people, regardless if you want to pay the £25, you get a text message and the clinic won't accept so then you have to go through a clinic to do the tests and the clinic obviously all the clinic prices are higher because it's private so you can't are you get talking about many blood tests? tests what kind of tests like the kind of tests like um before you go for treatment like std test gonorrhea hep b hep c yeah. all of those yeah. um yeah. You could go through for fertility tests through the NHS, but you'd be waiting quite a while. Um, and then if you explained that you were same sex, they would probably say you would have to go private. Um, and especially with NHS um, same sex fertility, you have to try six times before you even be considered your local CCG if they don't cover it. Yeah, six times. So yeah. you might as well go private because if you wait six times and then you have to wait on the waiting list to get seen, and then ages. it's a still away, it's ages. So that's why a lot of LGBT plus women, you know, we don't go for the NHS, plus the funding is being centre across the UK anyway. So yeah. I hope that answered that and, question. And you also said, uh, thank you for that. You also said um, we both used US sperm banks. We did. Um, there are loads of great other sperm banks out there too, like yeah. European ones. Um, and ones in the UK. So it kind of depends yeah. what you're after and whether you're looking for um, an anonymous donor or an open donor, because as you said, the UK is only open now. Um, so I hope that's been helpful. You've frozen. <laughs> I, hope I hope, yeah, you froze for a sec. I hope that the internet's froze. Right. Um, so the last thing I wanted to ask you was well, yeah. for you to um, tell everyone watching about uh, the community that you set up and how you help. Um, so LGBT Mummies Tribe is a organisation that educates, shares and celebrates LGBT plus women on their path to motherhood, whether it be fertility treatment, adoption, um, co-parenting, being a step-parent, fostering, um, any journey as a mother or a parent. Um, so we provide support groups. I've frozen again, I think. I know. <laughs> <laughs> my mouth stopped i um, think that it's because everyone's still in sort of in lockdown that everyone's on the internet at night we provide support groups we celebrate and share people's egg retrievals their gotcha days um their pregnancy announcements their births their beautiful children um and we share information knowledge brands fertility clinics banks so it's a one-stop shop for lgbt plus women to gain Amazing. support and knowledge on how to start a family and to a community so we do an event once a year um a uk meet and we have over 100 plus people attend each year it's just getting bigger and um, where you can make friends and meet other families that look like you and your children can meet other children with two mums or one mum or two mums and a known donor you know it's good that our children have that community and safe space to go oh wow they look just like our family yeah, um yeah. it is really important because in the media um we're not that visible and unfortunately we tend to be more visible we have really big brands um during pride and then kind of the rest of the year unless yeah. it's women appropriate we we don't pop up so it is really important to push um what you know who our families are and that we are normal and we're like everyone else um and that there's so many of us so many families are being created daily so it's really important yeah absolutely thank you so much for your well reliving your personal story and experience um and also That's for the okay. advice you give tonight um and mm -hmm. yeah unless anyone's got any more questions that's probably it so thank you so much no problem sorry it kept i don't know freezing <laughs> It does. The internet is a bit dodgy tonight. I don't know why. <laughs> but thanks to those for joining and um, speak to you soon. You too. Bye. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye.